the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one is called Towards Unity and deals with Chapter 7 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael Dissemlian. Unity. What does the Roman Catholic Church understand from unity? I think that we will learn in this chapter, as we have learned already, <laughs> anyway, when we study the Roman Catholic Church, that they have a different understanding of unity than Jesus Christ has. And what exactly is that, and how does that go together with the chapter we read before, the papacy and political power? Well, let's have a look at chapter 7 of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael Dissemlian. Towards Unity, starting on page 81, for everybody who wants to read along in his own copy of the book. The Pope has been able to carry his theme of unity into a forum, into any forum, however political. There were those at Strasbourg on 11th October 1988, apart from Northern Ireland Protestant leader Reverend Ian Paisley, who were asking why the Pope, who is seen as a spiritual leader, was addressing the European Parliament on political unity. I have to make a little comment here. We are speaking about of when the Pope was there on the 11th of, to uh, of October 1988, and if I'm not mistaken, a few years later, 1994, the Pope was again in the European Parliament. The same Pope, John Paul II. And also then was attending Reverend Ian Paisley, who called the Pope out for what he is. He stood up when the Pope started his speech and called out, I denounce you Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichrist. And then he was delegated out of the European Parliament. But at least he had the guts to stand up and call the Pope what he is. And I wondered when the Pope last year came to the United States of America to speak before a joint session of Congress, if anybody there would dare to do the same thing. Of course, nobody did. And Reverend Ian Paisley is in the meantime deceased. And I made a video on him teaching on the Jesuits that you can look up on my channel. And there is a video on YouTube where you can see his outbreak when Pope John Paul II was speaking to the European Union. I think 
it was in 1994, not 88, what we are talking about here. But the interesting question the people should ask themselves is, who, why is it that when the Pope is seen as a spiritual leader was addressing the European Parliament on political unity? Well, because <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church in the first place is a political power and just secondly, spiritual. It hides its political ambitions, it hides its political entity under the garment of so-called Christianity. His theme was of a united Europe, east and west, from the Urals to the Atlantic. Little more than a year afterwards his prediction seemed to be well on the way to fulfillment. Many Catholics as well as other increasingly drawn to the papacy believed that the Pope had spoken prophetically. <laughs> yeah. Because they don't know that he plans all this in advance, and I don't mean just the Pope, I mean the whole curia of the Roman Catholic Church, I mean the Jesuits. They plan things even a hundred years in advance. So it is not prophetically spoken. It is just when you have the information that other people don't have, <clears throat> then that can be maybe seen as being prophetically. But the Pope is as prophetic as one of the rats running here through my big yard at the moment. Vatican watchers are sure that the Roman Catholic institution played a major role in shaping events. And if you doubt that, just go to my reading on the first chapter of Rulers of Evil and uh, check the Holy Alliance that was published in 1992 between Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan to bring down the Soviet communist system that the Roman Catholic Church in the first place invented. At the same time there is no doubt at all that under the papacy of the Polish pontiff the Catholic Church in Eastern Europe has been greatly strengthened, particularly in Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. In December 1988 Cardinal Meisner, Bishop of Berlin, an East German born in Poland, was secretly elected Archbishop of Cologne and Primate of West Germany. He was the Pope's emphatic choice for the job. This may now be seen as having been a significant step toward the reunification of Germany. And I remember very well at the time when that happened, that had that happened, that I even drove from Brussels where I was living to Berlin to celebrate the reunification, the so-called reunification of Germany on the 3rd of October 1990. Little did I know at that time. But interesting to me is that in December 1988, Cardinal Meisner and Bishop of Berlin so I guess that was East Berlin, because in 1988 Germany was still split in East and West. He was an East German, as the author says, born in Poland, secretly elected Archbishop of Cologne and Primate of West Germany. So even before the coming down of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November, yes, 9-11 or 11-9 as you would call it, 1989, there was an East German <coughs> cardinal secretly elected Archbishop of Cologne, which is in Western Germany. Don't you think that is a little bit strange? These two arch enemies, <laughs> so called, the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic. And then you have a Bishop of Berlin who was secretly elected Archbishop of Cologne in West Germany before the wall falls down, so-called? I think this is at least significant, significant to notice. But now we go into <coughs> the Vatican and the Kremlin. Rome formed her working alliance with the Kremlin under the pontificates of John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth in the 60s and 70s. The new relationship was cemented by the appointment of the first East European Pope in 1978. What was started by Popes John and Paul 
was to continue under John Paul. And again, I have to make a little comment here. Is this just a play of words, of names? You have Pope John the Twenty Third, and you have John, uh, and you have uh, Pope Paul the Sixth, right? First Paul the Sixth, who opened Vatican II, and Pope John the Twenty Third, who then took over. So the one is called John, the other is called Paul. And the one to replace them is called John Paul I, who reigned for 33 days until he was poisoned. And then you have John Paul II. Don't you think it is a little bit strange that you have first Pope John, then Pope Paul, and then Pope John Paul? Interesting to note, eh? Anyway, the author continues here. The new era of Glasnost brought Moscow and the Vatican even closer. A very high-powered delegation of cardinals and Vatican officials attended the Orthodox Church Millennium Celebrations in Russia in 1988, and the two meetings between John Paul II and President Gorbachev followed in December 1989 and November 1990, both in the Vatican. As we have discussed in the chapter of the Virgin Mary, the Pope has a special burden for Russia, which, according to new Roman Catholic tradition, quote, Our Lady of Fatima has demanded be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart, with the promise that Russia, quote, will be converted if my demands are listened to, unquote. Now the author goes into a little footnote here and says, The present Pope's predecessor, Pius XII, he was reigning between 1939 and 1957. Pope Pius XII, speaking to Portugal in October 1941, while the Nazi army rolled towards Moscow, urged Catholics to pray for the speedy realization of Our Lady of Fatima's promises. After a speech by Hitler in 1942, claiming that Soviet Russia had definitely been defeated, Pope Pius XII, in a jubilee message over the radio, quote, consecrated the whole world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, unquote. And we can read that in Avro Manhattan's book, Vatican Imperialism in the 20th Century. So the whole world is consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We knew already from the United States, we knew by the Fatima messages that also Russia should be that way. So what does the Pope say in a jubilee message over the radio? He consecrated the whole world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now according to the Fatima magazine, Sister Lucia, one of the three Fatima children who is still alive, asked Jesus why he would not convert Russia without the Holy Father and the bishops making that consecration. Jesus replied, quote, Because I want my whole church to acknowledge that consecration as a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so that it may extend its cult later on and put devotion to the Immaculate Heart beside devotion to my Sacred Heart. Unquote. So, Jesus spoke to Sister Lucia, right, in person. And he spoke about his sacred heart and Mary's immaculate heart. Really? Really? Can you believe this? Do you get the deception you are in when you are a Roman Catholic? Jesus spoke to one of the survivors still at that time of the Fatima apparition, so-called, of Mary. And Jesus said, because I want my whole church to acknowledge that consecration is a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so that it may extend its cult later on and put devotion to the Immaculate Heart beside devotion to my Sacred Heart. I do not believe that Jesus ever would have said something like that. And I seriously doubt 
that it is the Jesus that we reven, uh, that we refer to in the Bible, the creator of this world, the one and only God and the one and only begotten Son of the Father, would ever say things like these. Here you see that these people are probably possessed by a different spirit. Surely not the spirit of God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. The real vicarius filii dei, when you want to use the Roman expression of the vicar of Christ here on earth until Christ's return, the Holy Spirit. This devotion to her immaculate heart is also a requisite for world peace. Malachi Martin, former Jesuit professor at the Vatican's Pontifical, Pontifical Biblical Institute and for many years a close associate of Cardinal Bia, relates that Pope John Paul II realized after exhaustive examination of the documents, witnesses and events of Fatima and after, quote, nothing less than a personal communication from heaven, unquote, that Fatima signified, quote, a geopolitical agenda attached to an immediate timetable. Heaven's millennium endgame has been revealed, with John Paul as the servant of the grand design, unquote. You can read that in Malachi Martin's book, The Keys of This Blood. Interviewed on Denver's KLTT 800 radio, Dr. Martin spoke of three forces battling for total domination of the planet. Well, it's not a planet, but that's another case. As the world races toward annihilation. Listen closely. The contenders were John Paul II, Mikhail Gorbachev and the capitalist West. The victor, Dr. Martin asserted, would be John Paul. As the world's spiritual and moral leader, he would lead a world government with absolute authority to decide all basic issues of human survival and human prosperity. What is more, he would achieve victory through grace, through the grace and power of Mary, not through Jesus Christ. Well, we are having to deal here with three contenders, according to Malachi Martin. John Paul II, meaning the office of the papacy, Mikhail Gorbachev, the then <coughs> president of the Soviet Union, and the capitalist West. So even, let us say, the president of the United States of America. Hmm? Doesn't matter. And he predicts that John Paul II, that the Pope would be the victor in the end. Well, I can predict that too, very simple, because when there are three players, and there are actually two, the Communist East and the Capitalist West, and the third, the papacy controls the other two, it is not very hard to say who at the end is the gainer. Thetis, Antesis, Synthesis. Thesis, communism, antesis, capitalism, synthesis, papacy. It all is very easy to understand when you know your history and when you know who writes history. We come to the next part of the chapter that is called Islam and Rome. The political power wielded by the mullahs in countries such as the former Soviet republics and Iran that are strategic to world peace is formidable and the Vatican is responding accordingly. Fatima and Mary, with their appeal to both Muslims and Catholics, and the wider ecumenism of the Roman Church, are helping to provide the answer. The upheavals in the Muslim world during the past few years which have brought deep disillusionment to many Muslims and many thousands of them to Christ have also led to an increasing openness to the ecumenical movement. For example, Zaki Badawi, principal of the Muslim College of London, speaking in August 1990 about Sun Myung Moon, also known as Reverend Moon of the Moonies, acknowledged that, quote, we respect his vision 
of bringing the world's religions together. Unquote. Whose vision? Whose vision? In this book it states, Sun Myung Moon. But I say, the Pope's vision. The Vatican Secretariat for Non-Christians sent a message to Muslims to mark the end of the Muslim fast of Ramadan, which finished on the 17th of May 1988. Quote, During the months of Ramadan, you have shown your faith in God and your submission to His holy will. This faith in the one God, living and true, a faith which is the heritage of all the spiritual children of Abraham, the father of believers, unites us as brothers and sisters in God and encourages us to work together for solidarity, justice and peace among all peoples. Unquote. From Cardinal Arinzi in the Vatican Secretariat, May 1988. An illustration of the practical outworking of this wider ecumenism of the Roman Church comes out of the Pope's visit to Malawi in May 1989. Arab missionaries supported by funds from oil-rich Gulf states were at the time increasingly active in that Central African nation. Reacting to the problems caused by this to the Mother Church, the Pope said, quote, what is required is mutual respect as well as mutual recognition of those things we share in common. Unquote. Always speaking about what we have in common. Never ever addressing anything that divides us. Then, in a prayer service attended by 15 representatives of different faiths, including a Muslim leader, the Pope declared that the Church wished to pursue a dialogue of heart and mind with all religions and work together with them to build up Malawi. The Church of Rome is very serious about interfaith ecumenism. Just want to remind you of the meeting in Assisi in 1986. Another example to illustrate just how seriously the papacy is pursuing the new strategy comes from Rome itself. There, the Vatican's mass media company St. Paul Audiovisuals is producing a 26-part cartoon version of the Koran for Arab TV. The work, which will take three years and costs 15 million pounds, is in partnership with the International Islamic Society. Quote, we are co-producing in the interests of ecumenism, said Father Eligio Ermetti of St. Paul's, who admitted that problems abounded. Not least presumably that the Quran condemns as infidels those who believe that God has a son. Unquote. You can read that in the Catholic Herald, 7th of July, 1989. Now we come to the Roman Empire restored. And if you want to get another information on that, go to my book Reading Behind the Dictators, Chapter 4, The Reestablishment of the Holy Roman Empire. But in this book, All Roads Lead to Rome, the author reads on the subject The Roman Empire Restored. Apart from the re-emergence of militant Islam, the alliance of Marxism and Catholicism was the remarkable phenomenon of the 30 years to, end, uh, to the end of the 80s. This unlikely partnership brought together religion and revolution, and the strengthening of the Roman Catholic Church as economic failure weakened the communist grip. Many evangelical Christians believing that we are nearing, quote, the end of the end time, Unquote, are still convinced, in spite of what has happened in Eastern Europe, that the joining together of the two great world systems of socialism and Catholicism is the unholy alliance of the beast and the false prophet of the book of Revelation, when you read chapters 16, verse 13 and 19, verse 20. A carefully laid clue to what was happening at the end of the last decade may have been provided by the December 1988 edition of The Economist under the heading, quote, A Common Market for the Spirit, unquote. Quote, 
two ideas unveiled Europe in, the 19, in 1988. The EEC's single European market and Mikhail Gorbachev's misty talk of a common European home. Watch out, says our special correspondent in Vatican City, for the coming of a third Euro idea in 1989. The Popes! Unquote. Newsweek magazine described the Euro idea in a September 1987 article. Quote, the Pope's international design is a utopian vision of a unified and Christianized, read Catholic, Europe, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Ural Mountains. Unquote. Pope John Paul II has announced a Europe-wide meeting of bishops in 1991 to draft a strategy designed to meet his vision for a kind of a golden age of Christian Europe, prompting the European newspaper to observe, quote, There is growing evidence that the Vatican's diplomatic advances are also giving the Church a leading role in the political reform of Eastern Europe, unquote. So, what is Catholicism all about? When it states here, there is growing evidence that the Vatican's diplomatic advances are also giving the Church a leading role in the political reform of Eastern Europe. We are not speaking about a spiritual reform, we are speaking about a political reform. So what's Rome all about, I ask you? Spirituality or politics? The Revelations in Time magazine in February 1992, uncovered by Watergate reporter Carl Bernstein, relating to the Vatican's role in Poland and wider role in the defeat of communism, certainly confirms this. Quote, uh, the papacy no longer merely proposes, once again she disposes. And what I've just read, Time magazine 1992, from Watergate reporter Carl Bernstein, that is the former mentioned Holy Alliance. Many believe, and not only Christians, that Europe is destined to be the center of a final world empire as the Holy Roman Empire restored. The Euro European newspaper reported in November 1990 that, quote, the Christian democratic leaders, uh, always understand this are Catholic leaders, not Christian, the Christian democratic leaders from Belgium, Germany, Greece, Italy, Luxembourg and the Netherlands backed far-reaching plans for transfer of national sovereignty and the establishment of a federal government with sole control over monetary, foreign and defense policy. Unquote. What do we have today since 2001? The Euro... Yeah, the one European currency, foreign policy and defense policy, not so much for the moment, but we have already the monetary union since 15 years here in Europe. Just a week after this announcement by the European heads of government, Margaret Thatcher, who had so resolutely opposed the advance of federalism, was removed from power. She did her job, now she's in the way, now get her out of the way. All the political change that has so swiftly taken place, the apparent collapse of the Soviet Empire, the emergence of democracy in Eastern Europe, and the forming of the unprecedented United Nations coalition for the Gulf War, even allying Muslims with the West against Muslims, suggests that union, both political and spiritual, may not be far off. The Bible certainly predicts this ultimate confederacy as well as comprehensively warning us about it. Yeah, the only thing you have to do is read the Bible and then you don't need to watch the news anymore because you understand everything that will happen from here on anyway. The European Union <coughs> is the next part in this chapter of that is called Towards Unity. 
our country's protest, reformed and biblical heritage. So the author is of course speaking here about England because he's an Englishman, English native. Our country's protestant, reformed and biblical heritage has guided us as a nation away from organic ties of any kind with Roman Catholic states. British foreign policy for centuries was wary of unity and always aimed at maintaining the balance of power in Europe. Prior to the fateful signing of the Treaty of Rome, the whole thrust of policy, empire and commonwealth has been directed in opposition to any kind of European integration. Margaret Thatcher, unlike her immediate predecessors as Prime Minister, was squarely in this tradition, jealous of British greatness and deeply opposed to European federalism and wary of the intentions of the Eurocrats in Brussels. Her differences with Jacques Delors, President of the European Commission at that time and architect of the growing European superstate, were Visceral. Roman Catholic Sunday Telegraph editor Peregrine Warstern described Jacques Delors as, quote, from a strongly Catholic French family who has a brand of social Catholicism which is hostile to the individualistic capitalism of the English speaking world, unquote, from the Sunday Telegraph, 6th of January 1991. For Monsieur Delors, who addressed the plenary assembly of French Catholic bishops at Lourdes in October 1989, socialism runs second to Catholicism. Jacques Delors is a product of Catholic social movement, as are German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, former President Andreotti of Italy, Prime Minister Felipe González of Spain, and former Prime Minister Tadeusz Mazowiecki of Poland. This Catholic social movement believes that, quote, there is no nobler task than the unifying of our continent. Now, the first EEC ambassador to the United States was described by Sky TV's Hour of Power program in February 1993 as, quote, a Dutch devoted Roman Catholic. So that is the first ambassador the EU or EEC at that moment sent over to the United States of America and he was a devout Roman Catholic. Dutch Prime Minister Ruud Lubbers, a devout Catholic who attended a Jesuit college, was the architect of the Maastricht Treaty on Political Union, as we can read in the Catholic Herald from 13th of November 1992. Lubas has worked closely with fellow Federalist Jacques Delors, also Jesuit educated, in furthering the Maastricht agenda, undeterred by the mounting distrust of the Treaty of the People of Europe. In Britain, in spite of the opt-out clauses that tempted us in, and the provision of subsidiarity, the political establishment has been split. Well, <laughs> reading here about the treaty that has an opt-out clause from Britain, and what did we see in 2016? The so-called Brexit, the British exit of the EU. And that word subsidiarity, well, that is pure casuistic and sophistry. Look it up. It can mean anything. That's why the author continues on that word. Subsidiarity is a thoroughly Jesuitical concept, capable of meaning many things to many people. There is no definition of it in the draft of the Maastricht Treaty. It will mean what people wish it to mean, presumably principally those at the center of power. The fact that it hasn't been flatly rejected unhappily reflects on the indecisiveness and lack of statesmanship of the government. The Daily Telegraph's Peterborough column reported on 14th of October 1989 that the then, uh, that the then Chancellor John Major admits fears of Britain being bypassed over future monetary strategy, claimed to be setting the European agenda. Quote, he made much play with subsidiarity. 
unquote. I wrongly thought that this clumsy word was another bit of new minted euro jargon, but a Catholic friend tells me that it is in fact established Vatican speak and first cropped up in Pope Pius XI's 1931 encyclical Quadrogasimo Anno, an origin which may only inflame the suspicions of those who believe that the community is simply the Holy Roman Empire revisited. Unquote. Peregrine Worcester arrived at the same conclusion. Writing in August 1991 in another leading article in the Sunday Telegraph had it Now a Holy Roman Empire? Worthan described John Paul II as quote, the most political pope of modern times. Unquote. Well, what do we have with Pope Francis today? We are talking here about the year 1991. 25 years later, we have Pope Francis exactly doing the same thing. There is nothing new under the sun. It is the movement towards federalism of the common market with the coming membership of East European countries as well as in the turmoil of the Soviet Union that the Pope may see the greatest possibility for an increase in Catholic political power since the fall of Napoleon or since the Counter-Reformation. If European federalism triumphs, the EC European community will indeed be an empire. It will lack an emperor, but it will have the Pope. It is difficult not to think that Wojtyla realizes this. Unquote. The papacy may succeed in doing more than reviving the old Holy Roman Empire. As Professor Malachi Martin reasons, quote, the papacy is best placed to run any world government which may emerge. If tomorrow or next week by a sudden miracle a one world government were established, the Roman Catholic Church stands alone as the first fully realized, fully practicing and totally independent geopolitical force in the current world arena. And the Pope is by definition the world's first fully fledged geopolitical leader. Unquote. Chapter 11 of the book of Genesis describes Babel, where mankind was unified politically and linguistically. The people began to build a tower for themselves to reach heaven. God scattered them and separated the languages to confound both unity and rebellion. There could be no unity under him for a fallen world. The unity that would be obtained was that of, quote, the God of this world who has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe, unquote, as we can read in Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Or Satan, also described in the Bible as the devil. Babel became the Babylon that runs like a thread through the Bible, caused by captivity, caused the captivity of God's people Israel, and uh, then as mystery Babylon, which has caused the peoples of the world to worship a false, political, religious, and now economic beast system until its fall. We read in Revelation chapter 17, verse 17, quote, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Unquote. Signs of the Times Under a picture of the Tower of Babel, a Council of Europe advertisement depicts Europe. Quote, Many tongues, one voice. Many Christians see that European community rapidly developing into a United States of Europe as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy as well as a rival of a kind of Holy Roman uh, as a revival of a, uh, of a kind of Holy Roman Empire.
The British Post Office produced a special stamp for the 1989 European elections, which displayed a picture of a loosely clad woman, resembling a harlot riding on a beast like a bull. Europe's flag had, has a circle of 12 stars and is colored blue, a configuration and color very closely resembling countless Catholic pictures of the Virgin Mary. A similar depiction, this time of the European Political Confederacy, appeared in Time magazine in December 1991. Time explained that they had based the picture on Homer's Iliad, showing Europa, the daughter of Phoenix, scantily dressed, riding on Zeus in the form of a bull. The Gibraltar 20 pence coin, closely resembling the ones in circulation, the one in circulation in Britain, has a Madonna and child image ringed over the words Our Lady of Europe. The future coinage intended for a united Europe is the ECU, EQ, that stands for European Currency Unit. Well, they didn't push it that way. They gave us the so-called Euro, not the ECU. But the ECU, it was called in the 80s and 90s. Anyway, the future coinage intended for United Europe is the ECU, the EQ, described by the Sunday Telegraph as, quote, the ecumenical coin, unquote. Three of four coins minted in Belgium have the image of historical heads of Europe, united as the Holy Roman Empire, namely Charlemagne, Charles V, and the 18th century Habsburg Empress Maria Theresa. The fourth coin, a 25 EQ piece, is of the Roman Emperor Diocletian, who attempted to restore the old pagan form of religion by the severe persecution of Christians at the beginning of the 4th century. Yeah, speaking about Revelation, one of the first chapters, the ten days of tribulation, between 3.03 and 3.13. That was the time of the big persecution. And when they couldn't get Christianity, kill Christianity, delete Christianity, well, Constantine came and just made it, made it the state religion. And by that, hit the political Roman emperor, pagan empire, under the garments of Christianity. A well-orchestrated publicity drive has pushed the Habsburg family back into the limelight in Austrian political circles. The last crown prince, Otto, a European member of parliament for the right-wing Christian, speak Catholic, social union, in his adopted Bavaria is convinced that the day of a European Reich will dawn. The campaign to annul the so-called Habsburg laws bearing the revival of the empire has the support of a large circulation newspaper and many conservative politicians. Otto and his son Karl are both working for the family's ideals transnational ideals in a modern political form, as we can read in the Sunday Telegraph, 22nd of November, 1992. Now, together with two other Roman Catholics, Dr. Otto von Habsburg was a member of the Committee for Pro-Christ 93, Billy Graham's campaign in Essen, Germany, in March 1993. So the Habsburgs, a former Austrian emperor family, Roman Catholic to the core, was a member of Billy Graham's campaign in Essen of Pro-Christ, 1993. Are you going to tell me that Billy Graham is a Protestant? The Protestant Alliance has asked why nobody informed us that the stars on the European flag are meant to symbolize the new Holy Roman Empire, with Mary symbolized as the Queen of Europe. 
with the European Commission going on a pilgrimage to Rome and other Brussels delegates travelling to Santiago de Compostela just to mark a jubilee of Europe. Facts like these should have been told to the people, as we can read in The Reformer, January-February 1993. I hope that my listeners and viewers of these videos will more and more get open eyes to see the deception of the Roman Catholic Church. It is not Christianity. It is not even spiritual. It is pagan to the core, has its roots in Babylon and is the enemy of the real body of Christ. Bible-believing Christians who adhere to the commandments because Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. All ten of them. This finishes chapter 7 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian. I thank you for listening and watching and commenting and I hope to see you next time and until then, God bless you. Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. Bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take the information in what happens about that. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. Alright, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground. Even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians. And that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.